Bene, sono le 15 ed un minuto, eh, buon pomeriggio a tutti, riprendiamo i lavori del nostro convegno dando il via alla sessione che riguarda le azioni di classe in Italia ed in Europa. Si tratta, come sapete, di un tema di grande attualità, di grande interesse, c'è un intenso dibattito in corso a livello istituzionale, a livello europeo, negli stati membri e che si caratterizza allo Stato da una, di una serie di esperienze in parte divergenti, in parte convergenti tra di loro. L'azione di classe, come sapete, risponde ad una serie di esigenze, esigenze ben precise, che mi limito qui solamente a ricordare, giusto per arrivare poi al cuore del nostro problema di questo pomeriggio. Queste esigenze sono sicuramente delle esigenze di giustizia sociale, di giustizia sostanziale, l'azione di classe è uno strumento che riequilibra, riequilibra i rapporti di forza nel mercato seppure con i limiti di un intervento eventuale ed ex post e nel corso delle sessioni di ieri e di oggi abbiamo tutti potuto apprezzare quanto tempo ci mette la giustizia per fare il suo corso definitivo. Comunque diciamo, è uno strumento che appare in linea a mio, a mio avviso con una massificazione dei rapporti business to consumer che è sempre più evidente, che ci riguarda sempre più da vicino sia nei rapporti business eh, to consumer che business versus small businesses e vedremo oggi insomma, nel panel vediamo di sviluppare anche questo aspetto di cui si è pure parlato ieri. C'è inoltre una grande esigenza, una grande finalità di, di efficienza. Da sotto tre punti di vista, sotto il punto di vista dell'attore, sotto il punto di vista del convenuto, sotto il punto di vista più generale del sistema eh, giuridico, del sistema di tutela giudiziale eh, dei diritti. È evidente che gestire d'un sol colpo una controversa massiva beneficia a tutti e noi in Italia eh, diciamo, abbiamo ben vivo il ricordo del lunghissimo contenzioso RC Auto, un, un ricorso che, un contenzioso che ha coinvolto migliaia e migliaia di consumatori e che ancora oggi, la su cui ancora oggi la Corte di Cassazione continua a pronunciarsi. Un altro elemento di efficienza è quello sicuramente di evitare il rischio di, situazioni, di soluzioni confliggenti e qui chiaramente ehm, penso insomma, di sfondare veramente una porta aperta a quello che gli operatori giuridici e gli operatori economici hanno bisogno, specie insomma, in un'economia libera, in un'economia di mercato, è la certezza delle soluzioni giuridiche. E veniamo quindi al nostro panel. Il nostro panel oggi ruota intorno all'idea delle azioni di classe in Europa. La mia idea, la nostra idea era quella di fare il punto su a che, appunto, a che punto siamo sulle azioni di classe in Italia ed in Europa e soprattutto cosa ci possiamo aspettare in un prossimo futuro. A livello europeo, mh, carpivo un po' anche la posizione di Mider eh, questa mattina, eh, si sta comunque delineando una posizione ben definita a livello istituzionale, eh, abbiamo tutti in mente la risoluzione del Parlamento europeo del febbraio del 2012, il Parlamento europeo ha stabilito due paletti ben precisi, e cioè evitare un sistema di tipo statunitense e, e soprattutto per evitare gli abusi di questo sistema, oggi Michael sarà qui proprio per spiegarci quali sono effettivamente questi abusi, anzi io pregherei ehm, Michael di sottolinearci anche qualche pregio del sistema statunitense, io credo che sono fermamente convinto che aspetti positivi del sistema nordamericano di class action ce ne siano e vale la pena tenere in considerazione. E poi evitare, questa è l'altra preoccupazione della, del, del Parlamento, ma in generale delle istituzioni comunitarie, evitare un sistema che non rispetti la tradizione giuridica europea. E qui, se leggete la risoluzione del febbraio del 2012, si apre un'elencazione molto chiara di quali sono i problemi che secondo la, eh, il Parlamento europeo devono essere affrontati secondo la nostra tradizione giuridica, cioè evitare il danno punitivo, evitare le contingency fee, non prevedere il patto di quota lite, assolutamente tenersi lontani dalla discovery e inoltre mantenere un sistema che sia opt-in e non opt-out. Ora però vedremo che nel frattempo che l'Unione Europea, Europea, le istituzioni europee decidano veramente il da farsi e ci diano, ci diano delle, delle istruzioni precise su questi aspetti, vediamo che vari Stati membri hanno mh, elaborato delle loro soluzioni. Vedremo per esempio che in Portogallo c'è un sistema opt-out che funziona, seppure con alcuni limiti. Anche in Olanda c'è un sistema opt-out per quanto riguarda i settlement. Um, in Re nel Regno Unito si sta pensando, c'è una posizione molto chiara del governo del, del Regno Unito dove si dice che il sistema opt-out è un sistema efficace ed efficiente. 
Eh, beh, però allora se guardiamo in effetti alla tradizione giuridica anche diciamo nostrana possiamo vedere che anche in Italia noi abbiamo un sistema opt-out seppure extragiudiziale che eh, riguarda in realtà tutti noi pensate al registro pubblico delle opposizioni e sto parlando in un settore che è quello della privacy e questo registro pubblico si fonda chiaramente sul sistema opt-out cioè tutti i cittadini, tutti noi che, si, che abbiamo un elenco telefonico una linea, una, che abbiamo una linea telefonica censita dall'elenco telefonico se non chiediamo a questo registro di essere tirati fuori riceviamo le sollecitazioni commerciali abbiamo qualche dato su oltre 21 milioni di utenze telefoniche fisse un milione di cittadini ha operato l'opt-out questo che cosa significa? significa che il sistema opt-out ha una grandissima valenza inclusiva e quindi se vogliamo avere le azioni di classe efficace, probabilmente un sistema opt-out non sarebbe sbagliato. Si è parlato anche ieri delle piccole e medie imprese e c'è un grandissimo dibattito sul riconoscere anche a queste piccole e medie imprese la legittimazione attiva a proporre un'azione di classe. Abbiamo sentito la posizione di Martinello ieri pomeriggio. Beh, non dimentichiamoci che le piccole e medie imprese sono definite dal legislatore comunitario molto in maniera molto precisa e sono piccole quelle imprese che hanno meno di 50 dipendenti ed un fatturato inferiore a 10 milioni di euro, quindi sono piccole ma se pensiamo al nostro tessuto sociale ed economico sono imprese importanti che giocano un ruolo molto importante nella nostra società e soprattutto le medie sono poi, a mio modo avviso, imprese piuttosto rilevanti, quelle che hanno impiegati, eh, con un numero di impiegati inferiore a 250 e ehm, un fatturato inferiore a 50 milioni di euro. Inoltre, e qui e questo è emerso un po' chiacchierando anche con voi in questi giorni, c'è un'istanza sociale volta a chiedere un intervento dei legislatori in materia di azioni di classe. E non è un caso del resto che due importanti stati membri, penso alla Francia, penso anche all'Inghilterra, hanno, lo dicevo poco fa, fatto delle consultazioni pubbliche molto avanzate, hanno adottato dei documenti dove il governo sta cercando di prendere posizione su questa tematica. Eh, e dopo appunto sia Muriel Chagny eh, eh, che gli altri insomma, membri del nostro panel ci diranno qual è l'esperienza di questo dibattito eh, devo darvi purtroppo una notizia la, la professoressa Muller non, è potuto, non ha potuto partecipare al nostro convegno per dei imprevisti, problemi familiari mi sono accertato che questi problemi siano risolti in maniera positiva quindi nessun problema per Rachel tra l'altro Rachel ci aveva anche dato un handout del suo intervento che avrete avuto già nella vostra cartella e quindi spendo veramente gli ultimi due minuti della mia eh, brevissima presentazione cercando di così, trovare qualche spunto interessante eh, per il dibattito, eh, cercando di riprendere quello che rilevava eh, la professoressa Muller. E cioè che in Inghilterra si sta pensando di adottare un intervento specifico per l'antitrust e non un intervento generale per tutte le violazioni del diritto dei consumatori, che invece questo, invece questo è l'approccio eh, ribadito da ultimo dal Parlamento europeo, si sta cercando di dare una legittimazione sia alle piccole e medie imprese che ai consumatori, si sta cercando di intervenire con un sistema opt-out, quindi qui veramente la, la discussione credo si possa, mh, sto cercando veramente di, di tirare delle fila per, per, per stimolare la discussione anche con voi successivamente. Ed inoltre eh, l'altro punto chiaro del, che, che leggiamo nella posizione del governo eh, inglese è quella di non eh, riconoscere i punitive damages e soprattutto di non riconoscere la legittimazione attiva a delle organizzazioni ad hoc o anche agli studi legali per proporre azioni di classe. Come vedete le differenze su questi specifici punti che poi attengono alla effettività di questo strumento di tutela collettiva sono molto variegate, il dibattito è apertissimo, io tra l'altro approfitto del fatto che avremo qualche minuto in più a causa dell'assenza di Rachel per appunto fare un passing on di questo tempo in più su di voi, cioè, vorrei veramente stimolare il dibattito anticipandolo, ne parlavo con Michael eh, prima, anticipandolo anche al coffee break in modo tale da avere un dibattito specifico sugli aspetti della class action diritto comunitario ma veramente non mi dilungo oltre e chiedo all'avvocato e professore eh, Van Empel di dirci che cosa sta succedendo per quanto riguarda le azioni di classe in Olanda. Martin, the floor is for you. Thank you. Grazie. Ah, ah. ah e poi... Ah, ah. ah ecco. Eh, può anche scegliere la presentazione ah sì ok va bene well you 
will not be surprised to find that I shall address you in English. Uh, I'm always told that uh, although I buy an, Ameri um, an Italian tie, I buy an Italian shirt, I buy um, uh, Italian shoes, I buy an Italian s uh, costume, people in the street will immediately recognize that I'm not Italian. <laughs> So I gave up, and uh, so you will have to bear with me in um, uh, having me uh, addressing you in uh, English. And uh, I shall, uh, I have been invited to cover the situation in the uh, Netherlands. And um, I uh, hope to be able to uh, give you a, a fair presentation in the time which has been allotted to me. Uh, if time allows, um, I would very much like to add to that just a few uh, remarks of a more general nature which, uh, for which I have been inspired by the discussions of yesterday afternoon. But uh, let's wait and see uh, how this uh, how this works out. Now uh, to uh, yeah okay. Now I have to show to you that I can handle it. Yeah. Um, so you see, um, contrary to what has just been reported on the situation as envisaged for the Uni United Kingdom, in Holland um, there are no specific statutory provisions uh, for competition law class actions. And so any discussion of uh, competition law litigation shares in the uh, general legal ordinance of, for, for class actions. And as we shall see, actually, the development of uh, the thinking and the politics on um, class actions in the Netherlands has been much more inspired by other cases in other fields than they have been in for the field of competition law. And this, uh, I hope you will allow me to uh, just comment briefly again on what I caught yesterday uh, in the discussions, um, where it seemed to me that uh, it was uh, suggested that uh, the, on average the people of uh, the uh, Netherlands um, are more uh, out for uh, the competitive uh, model and uh, that therefore you could expect them to embrace with some enthusiasm um, kinds of actions which would promote the enforcement of competition law. Um, I feel that I have to uh, put a question mark um, uh, to that. Um, I would say that, uh, and, and this explains, I hope, uh, the uh, development which I'm going to describe, that's why I, I, I address it already now. Um, the, um, the politics of, of, of Holland and the underlying sociology are um, much inspired by a, uh, I, I dare to say, corporatistic approach but not a corporatistic approach imposed from the top, but rather a, an attitude which, if you wish, goes back to the uh, cities of the Middle Ages in the Low Countries, where the, the guilds, the corporations, um, were actually uh, promoting their own economic interests and saw to it that the government was acting in accordance with its, with their, uh, the corporation's priorities. And um, if, if you now look at Holland today, you will find that this uh, concept of 
the, what we like to call the social partners. That is, um, say, the uh, Dutch uh, equivalent of the Koffindustria on the one hand, and the trade unions on the other hand, tend to sit down together if the, uh, there is a real problem uh, economically on the macroeconomic level and uh, come to an agreement. And they, and that is the, the crucial point I, I want to make, they know that if they come to an agreement, then they just turn around and tell the government, this is what we have agreed to, now please uh, you implement this. And um, we had very recently, in I think the last uh, past week, or, uh, 10 days ago perhaps, we had a, a situation in which uh, this happened. The, 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 the government, responsible to parliament, had planned a cut in, uh, in, in, in expenditure of uh, the state uh, in uh, the order of 6 billion uh, euro, and um, which implied all kinds of cuts, as you can imagine, also from the experience uh, a, a here in, in, in Italy. And then this, the, this agreement between the social partners came round to finding that those cuts were not the thing to do because they would slow down the economy, all the arguments which we by now are all familiar with. And lo and behold, the government said, oh yes, of course, uh, that's what we'll do. And uh, the prime minister saw to it that uh, the, in parliament it was presented as if it was the government's policy. But for anyone having watched the situation over the last few days, they were perfectly aware that this was a solution bottom upwards from the social partners. Now, this takes me to the point which was also uh, raised yesterday. The individual as a consumer or the individual as a worker, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, if you take now the uh, look at the background which I just sketched out to you, you will realize that in Holland uh, the emphasis is indeed logically very, <coughs> excuse me, very much on the uh, individual as a worker. It is the job which is important and if uh, he earns a, a bit of money uh, on top of that, uh, uh, that's fine. But the, the real main thing is the, uh, the job. And so if you then, and this takes me then gradually to the subject which has, has been allotted to me, um, if you then look at the actions uh, which come to the notice of the daily papers on uh, the enforcement of competition policy, um, you will find less emphasis on uh, getting back money from abusers of dominant position or of conspiracies uh, of cartels. No, it is the, 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 I would say, if I were pressed for, for it, I would say at this moment, the issue which is politically important is an attempt by small and medium businesses to get an exemption from the uh, competition rules, from the strict enforcement of the competition rules, in order to counterbalance the powers of the big uh, traders, the, um, the major supermarkets for, for tea, sugar, milk, etc., etc., or the department stores. And so, uh, those who, f and then I come to the uh, class action, but the, uh, so you should see the development. And I would say the very modest development in terms of class action and generally private enforcement of uh, competition law, you should see that against the background of this particular attitude to the um, uh, organization of 
the state and the economy and society. Okay, then the next one. So we say we have um, no special um, article for competition law. We have two major statutory provisions um, which are relevant to the issue of uh, class action. On the one hand, there uh, is a, a provision in the Civil Code uh, three, 305A, which was introduced in 1994, uh, and there is a separate act uh, which uh, I will not. Uh, I will not. I will spare you the the Dutch name, which um, but the Act on Collective Settlement of Mass Damage, which goes by the uh, ab abbreviation of WCAM. And um, so I now shall uh, briefly uh, comment on those two uh, provisions first. Article three. Uh, 305A of the Civil Code. Uh, you oh, oh. Um, you find the first paragraph is a an attempt by myself on an uh, exact uh, uh, translation into English of the Dutch text. Um, so it is a foundation or association with full legal personality who will act in proceedings for the safeguarding of similar interest of other persons, other than the foundation or association, to the extent it is concerned with those interests in accordance with its bylaws. So there, there is, I come to, to that in a moment. And then, in summary, the second and, on, and following provisions, um, there is no allowance for uh, immediate action without having first sought an amicable uh, settlement and perhaps very well certainly very important is uh, that the object of the court action by this uh, foundation or association cannot be a claim for damages it can only uh, hope to get from the court a declaratory judgment on, as to the uh, legality, illegality of the action uh, complained of, uh, or uh, the, uh, as we shall see, the contrary. And then uh, there is a veto right for a party concerned with regard to certain grounds for action. The, uh, the individual party may say, I don't want you uh, to make use of an argument which uh, is more specific to me and which could risk to suffer from being put together in one basket with the arguments of uh, other uh, parties concerned. And then there is the uh, possible opt-out with regard to effects of the judgment. Now, uh, the... Uh, uh, just a, a few comments on these. Um, oops. Um, yeah, the uh, action can be based on not only on tort but also on contract. So even uh, um, if uh, you have a uh, well, you, 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 of course you, you, we all know that there are many situations in which a trader trades on the basis of a series of uh, standard contracts and then of course uh, it is it might be of interest uh, for uh, those con concerned to have their uh, the, the, the validity of uh, the, that uh, agreement to put, put be put to the test in in court and uh, the declaratory character of the judgment um, are for are a matter of individual concern to the parties. So the uh, nullity of the contract, but also of concern to us here today, uh, the possibility of claiming damages uh, will be for the individual parties to uh, argue and to bring to 
uh, court, then for a foundation or association to be allowed to act in proceedings, its bylaws should focus on the interests at issue, and this focus should be evidenced by its actual activities. This to prevent a kind of exercise in which I, I look at my uh, American <laughs> friend where we uh, uh, may suspect that uh, the uh, draftsman of, the, of this text had in mind the kind of ambulance chasing and, and, and the like in the, the, the worrying aspects of the American situations. It should be a decent, serious association uh, which had been uh, already meeting uh, uh, on, on the subject and uh, would not be specifically set up for fighting this case and then perhaps reaping certain uh, rewards from that. And uh, also here the court may uh, test the uh, issue as to the re uh, truly adequate representative character of that association. So you see the same, same concept there. My personal view is that for competition law purposes, um, this uh, is not very, very, very important or useful because uh, the objective uh, which you seek with an action like this, a collective action, is to get a, uh, uh, an authoritative decision on the legality or illegality of the, an act of, or a, a, a text imposed by the other side, by the dependent. Now, rather than uh, to uh, fight the case before a court in, uh, on the basis of this provision of the civil code, I, as a practicing lawyer, would rather say, let's have a try in Brussels or at the uh, national competition authority. That would be much cheaper for uh, the client. The, the administrative authority will do all the work. They will find that yes or no, it is legal, illegal. Uh, and then we are at the same level because then uh, whether we have a statement by a court or a statement by the Commission for practical purposes, for fighting the, uh, the, the, the claim for damages uh, in the Dutch courts uh, will be, I would say, substantially similar, would be substantially the same because uh, whatever the formal uh, uh, aspects um, uh, of, the, of EU law, etc. Anyway, in practice, Dutch courts on the issue of uh, infringement of Article 101, 102 uh, will tend to follow uh, safely and honestly the uh, findings of the European Commission. So, for our present purposes, um, I, I would say it is uh, uh, not that uh, important. It's perhaps nice that we have the possibility, but uh, not necessarily very, very useful. Oops. And then we have the other one, which is uh, the Act on the uh, Collective Settlement of Mass Damage, the WCAM. And um, I, once again, I, I have tried to summarize this in my own words. Um, the first point, and this is what you have to keep in mind, is that uh, there is settlement. That you, you, this is a, a collective settlement, but it is a settlement which can only be enforced on the basis of an agreement freely reached between claimants and uh, uh, who are represented by an association or a foundation and uh, the defendant. So there has to be an agreement. And then if there is an agreement, then that agreement can be declared on the uh, request of the parties, binding by the court, 
with specific jurisdiction, which has this jurisdiction has been granted to the Court of Appeals of, the, uh, of Amsterdam. And um, this then, this binding agreement uh, is also declared binding on all possible claimants subject to an opt-out within a relatively short period specified by the court, three to six months. So what the, the sequence is you, you negotiate, you then come to an agreement, and you go to the court in Amsterdam and you ask them to uh, put their seal to it. And if they have done so, this uh, agreement is binding on both sides uh, are subject to a short period uh, opt-out. And why is this uh, of uh, interest to also the defendant party? Because that is my third point. Uh, that is that such an agreement uh, provides for an overall aggregate lump sum based upon a recent estimate of possible justified claims which estimate is approved by the court. So you take an estimate to the court, you say, look, we feel that there are so many, say, victims, so many potential plaintiffs uh, around. Um, we are prepared to put so much money uh, on the line f in terms of compensation overall, and then that is it. If then it turns out after the court has approved this agreement that there are more plaintiffs, more claimants who have a justified claim just like the others for compensation, this does not result in an increase of the amount due by the defendant. The defendant can wash his hands of the surplus. He said, look, then you share it out amongst yourself on a pro rata basis. And so that is, you see there, there is a, a, I would say, a very strong consensual element in this arrangement. And uh, this uh, is, uh, has been enacted um, by, uh, because it was triggered by a case uh, related to negative consequences of use of an anticonception device for, for the babies to be born. And there was a strong element of negative publicity which finally forced the defendant's company into a amicable cent settlement. But that, was, that took still uh, something like six years to reach. Okay, yeah. Uh, I uh, oh, we'll be able to do that. Um, other um, <clears throat> so it is the negative publicity which is a crucial uh, uh, crucial element, and uh, the um, the so we have had a, n a number of other uh, cases which have been uh, dealt with uh, on uh, and have resulted in amicable settlement uh, for, uh, but they were not in the antitrust field. They were disappointed uh, uh, investors. Uh, and, and it was and also a case of bankruptcy. But the, the, the uh, antitrust was, for, I would say, for reasons which I have sought to explain at the beginning. Um, the uh, the, 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 it was not of specific interest. Then uh, the, there have been moves to better the situation uh, on, uh, with regard to the existing test. There are still more stringent uh, check on the uh, neutrality, the honesty of the, of the parties representing the uh, claimants. And more important, I would say most important potentially, is that there is now in a bill uh, which has still to be discussed in Parliament a suggestion that 
the court of Amsterdam uh, should get itself involved uh, more um, uh, more um, actively and that uh, so the uh, uh, defendant party the the, 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 the could be if not forced, well, it could be suggested in a very strong way that they uh, should um, uh, com uh, conclude to an uh, agreement. And um, the, uh, but I, I have to tell you that, uh, in particular, this particular provision has been uh, objected to by the Council of State, which in our constitutional system. Uh, is the major advisor to the, the to the legislature, government and parliament, and uh, who objected to this uh, involvement, active involvement of the court, uh, uh, because it would upset the uh, traditional position of the courts in the uh, constitutional uh, system. Now, um, I, uh, in the few minutes which are uh, left to me. I uh, shall just uh, mention to you a, a, a few cases which have not been very uh, substantial in, in results, uh, where um, beyond the, the provisions of the, uh, of the um, uh, new acts, um, there has been uh, a, uh, some uh, uh, collective element. One is what is referred to as the building fraud case, uh, which was a uh, case in which virtually the whole of the building industry in Holland was uh, alleged, at least, at least and uh, co collectively accepted finally, that there had been uh, fraud in um, uh, bidding, in, in, in uh, co uh, call for tenders, and um, in uh, the settlement, there was a collective settlement of the uh, uh, competition authority with the collective, co uh, collective branch of uh, the building industry. Uh, it was agreed that part of the deal was the willingness to uh, pay uh, damages to those who had suffered. But please note that the willingness was uh, imposed, but not the actual amounts, because uh, the um, actual amounts, as we have once again seen this morning with the passing on uh, exercise, is very hard to calculate. And so um, uh, there was a nice point of principle there, but once again the situation was uh, uh, not very rewarding in terms of uh, f further uh, uh, collecting of uh, of damages by the, those who had who alle were alleged to be uh, to have suffered, and there are a few uh, few other cases which are still in, and uh, you find them in the uh, yeah here um, in the uh, in my uh, outline which we will hopefully be able to distribute. Um, that um, the, there was a beer cartel by the by the commission, uh, which had been uh, by the has been uh, uh, established by the by the commission. There uh, and another one is uh, the freight cartel of the airlines, and uh, there again uh, the commission has stated its mind. It has fi imposed fines uh, now. Those uh, who allege to have suffered damages are claiming, uh, indeed, damages from, respectively, the brewers and the uh, airlines. But as I see it, it's still a long way off before we actually see money passing hands. So on those uh, words, I think that I have now did my duty within reasonably the time allotted to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Grazie molte Martin per questa interessantissima presentazione che ci ha fatto capire come 
le differenze, sì, adesso c'è un cambio, piccolo cambio, allora approfitto per rilevare una cosa che mi, mi è sembrata interessante, cioè ci sono un sacco di differenze, eh, differenze che avete potuto notare non solo da un punto di vista sostanziale e procedurale, ma anche io credo da un punto di vista di sistematica, eh, di sistematizzazione dell'azione di classe nell'ambito delle fonti del diritto. Eh, Martin ci ha detto chiaramente che la previsione delle azioni di classe è contenuta nel codice civile, noi abbiamo una previsione di uno strumento di aggregazione processuale nel codice del consumo e adesso la professoressa Rossi tra qualche secondo ci dirà che la norma cardine delle azioni di classe in Portogallo è contenuta nella Costituzione, quindi anche su questo forse vale la pena fare una riflessione tutti insieme, quindi non ehm, perdo altro tempo per presentare la professoressa eh, Leonor Rossi dell'Università di Lisbona. Prego Leonor. Um, All right. Um, good afternoon. I'm going to behave very badly this afternoon because I'm going to speak English. And um, everyone, well, some people know that I can speak Italian, but I've been so impressed by everyone else's level that I'm going to back out today, yeah. okay? So um, give me a break. And uh, <laughs> I will speak Italian in the corridors. I think in any other university on earth I would speak Italian except this one because yeah. I have a lot of debts here. Um, I want to explain, um, I've, I've been asked to tell you about the Portuguese system and the reason why I'm here and why someone from another country is in here is it because some time ago a colleague of mine said to me, um, did you know that we have this really fantastic system of private enforcement? And I said, we do? And I, you know, I, I'm a professor of European law, so I could be that distracted. I'm not a civil procedure person, but... And then we were asked to tell other people about our system. And when we went to look, you know, it would be strange that we'd have such a fantastic system and we wouldn't be so aware of it. And then I started asking around, but I mean qualified people, and I said, you know, what is the private enforcement status in Portugal? And they said, well, there isn't any. So that was a terrible place to start, and I teamed up with two scholars. Um, Nun Garopa is an economic um, analysis of law person uh, that most of you might have uh, know through the literature, and Miguel Sousa Ferro is a very competent um, jurist in public law, and he specialized in nuclear energy law, so we're a very strange group. <laughs> But um, we went and um, looked at What's going on in Portugal and, and why is everyone talking about the law? Well, we have um, three um, separate co um, contexts of class actions. We have uh, administrative law, a special area of securities law, and in competition law what we have is a civil popular action that was designed for consumers. Okay, so we've used the, the law for consumers for Um, the, the competition context. And we went to look at, so if this is a civil popular action, what, what is going on in, 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 the, in the country? So from 1983 to 2012, we only have 37 cases where uh, competition issues were discussed in common declaratory actions. So um, where the citizens have gone to the court, and I think it's extremely important to stress that the Portuguese citizen will go to the, to the civil court and say to the civil judge, um, oh, and you know, I have, I have some damages, I have a problem, and by the way, it also violates competition rules. This is what we saw by reading the cases. And the judge was as much hysterical as the, as the plaintiff because the judge didn't know what to do in most cases. And I think it's important that we say, well, We, we made a mistake because we needed to comfort the, the judiciary before. We needed to give the judge instruments to help the person who says, oh, and by the way, it's also a competition law enforcement. And anyway, we, we did some statistics and, and only 19% of the cases were, was anyone actually asking for damages? And none of the plaintiffs were ever successful and ironically, the only case where there was a success of money was in a counterclaim. So um, it's a very strange uh, world. In none of these cases, these 37, was there a class action. 
what it, where, how is the class action uh, design? We have a very old class action. If you take a look, it's from 1995. So I was really surprised. And um, it, the, the rights of class action is in the Constitution. And what we have is um, the, the Constitution grants the rights to, to citizens either personally or via associations um, to, to, to defend these, these rights. And we have health, you see consumer rights, and quality of life and environment and cultural, he cultural heritage. Um, what happened is that we implemented this constitutional uh, rule through uh, uh, the, the, what we call the Lei d'Assemblée of 1995. And we're using it, both for the civil and the, and the administrative actions. And what happened in Portugal? I, I, when I finally understood, I felt um, extremely disappointed because, you see, hearing Martin, what you hear is a very task-oriented system in Holland. However, even if there are problems where a lump sum is paid and then the defendant pays the money and pulls out and says, now you divide it, okay? In Portugal, the doctrine started arguing the civil procedure doctrine, uh, not the European <laughs> law professors, on the difference between diffuse interests and homogenous inv individual interests, scaring the judges, just saying, OK, right, you're going to have a very, very hard theoretical fight. And the only case, um, well, the, the, the only action that was actually um, very important was an action against telecom. And what happened was that it was obvious that telecom was overcharging its clients. Now the clients were 1,300,000. And it apparently, from after reading the Supreme Court ruling, um, if I am not wrong, telecom overcharged each of these individuals in 9 euros 75 cents. Okay, so you, can, you see the amount of money that's at stake. And, um, the action went through the courts, and at all the, all the time, the, the, they would call in a hired gun to say that um, it, there was a very complicated issue of um, diffuse interests and, and uh, individual fragmented interests, and saying that the, the action could only be for declaratory purposes. And the Supreme Court started solving the problems it was able to solve. And one of the problems it solved, it says, okay, it's not only for declaratory, it's also for condemnatory. So that was, you see, we, the judges are our most dear partner because they solve the problem. So we had the first issue solved by the Supreme Court. But then um, the Supreme Court uh, stopped. I think it's energy to, to go forward. Maybe it was on that day. Um, I don't think it's bad. I think the Supreme Court was extremely frank, and we should look at the judgment for what it was. It says it, it was the, the Supreme Court said, I have an action. I'm going to say, I'm going to declare that telecom owes 10 euros to these, this group of people. But I'm not sure that my ruling can be executed. Um, and the the reason that is not clear in the judgment, but it seems to be between the lines, is that it seems to the judges that the claimant, so the plaintiff, um, in, that has the standing to propose the axio popularis, is not the correct party to require liquidation. And that would, so you need other actions. And the judge said, well, but it's not my problem, so I'm going to make this ruling. And we went to see, well, who has standing? What's going on? I mean, who would require liquidation? We don't have the answer. But who has standing? Uh, who has standing is citizens and, as, as it seems to be very common, legally constituted associations or foundations. Except the uh, Portuguese system is much more liberal because the association can be ad hoc. It doesn't have to have existed before, so you could just constitute an association uh, to get standing. What is also common to other places, you don't have um, uh, people who carry out economic activities with profit motives. So that excludes companies, small, medium companies, and law firms. Um, and, and so, um, and we have an opt-out system. So this is how the law is designed. 
Now, if, if you, we have, um, I don't know if this happens in other countries, so the, the judges can say, well, it's obviously um, unlikely that this is going to succeed and, and, and reject the action. But if it doesn't happen, we're going to have erga omnes effects. And the publicity requirement is not very intense because you have to publicize this through some specific posters and two newspapers and eventually one regional newspaper if it is relevant. People can do uh, three things. You can do nothing and be represented without a mandate. You can in intervene in proceedings or opt out until the deadline that is determined by the judge. So we, we don't have um, specific, uh, specific timings. Um, and we have um, two exceptions to the uh, effects of res judicata, which would be if the action is unsuccessful uh, due to insufficient evidence of the existence of the infringement, the damages, or the causal link. Or there is an open, uh, an open rule where the court could decide that to limit res judicata. But we have no jurisprudence, so uh, we don't know really what's going to happen. What is interesting is we don't also have a rule on conflict. So you could have um, a common declaratory action being um, lodged at the same time by people who don't have standing for the popular action, or you can have two popular actions on the same subject, and we don't have um, uh, default, clear default rules on, on, on what would happen in that case. Okay, so we're missing that. Um, w the court costs seem to um, break the, the, the Portuguese traditional rules in the sense that the claimants are exempt from initial court costs, and even if you're totally unsuccessful, you'd pay only uh, 10 to 50 percent of normally applicable costs and the, and the winner um, pays nothing rule um, may also not be enforced. So there is a, an incentive for the associations uh, to come forth. Uh, claiming compensation is time barred, um, three years after the judgment uh, becomes res judicata. But what's interesting is while the company is not, does not have standing to propose the action, it does have standing to come and claim uh, the damages that the, that the association um, uh, might be able to recover. Now, this is where uh, I think that we need some more uh, legislative intervention, but I think before that we should really talk to the judiciary. One, how, could, how do you handle compensation? Well, the, if everything goes well, it would be through an agreement. Um, what if uh, um, there is no agreement? And m this is the part that's missing in the law. The law is totally omiss. How, um, uh, what does the judge do uh, about the money? And the, the problem seems to relate in, in, to cases in which victims are identified or are not identified. And this is where, again, this idea of um, diffuse interests and um, individual fragmented interests comes again. So um, the, the law establishes that the judge could decl de declare that a certain damage has occurred. And, and for that part, you have the rules of civil liability. But there is a possibility of establishing a lump sum, but that does not have to be at the same time as the, as the civil popular action and can be left for later, which is what the Supreme Court did, saying nobody asked me to, so I'm going to declare that a certain damage is done, but um, I'm not going to calculate uh, the global lump sum. But what if our, our, our study and our... Um, uh, um, proposal is the following. So if all injured parties are identified, you're not going to run into a lot of problems because you have the claimants and um, you, you, you would have um, the, 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 the amount of money identified. Um, we have um, the, the two uh, alternative uh, theories uh, in the doctrine coming forth is can you um, only give individual compensation for identified parties and serve the, save the lump sum for uh, those who are not. Okay, this is what um, um, was being discussed. School A says you can apply both types of compensation to homogeneous individual interests. So you'd be interest, um, um, entitled as a claimant to the damage done and then to a part of the lump sum. The Supreme Court has says um, the following. No. Um, I only compensate uh, the, ind the individual interests to the damage done and um, the, the, then the, the lump sum 
would be reserved for diffuse interests. It's a very, uh, but uh, as, as we only have one ruling from 2003, so that's 10 years ago, but in Portugal this does not constitute a legal precedent. So that the judge, even the Supreme Court, is, is free uh, to overrule um, it, what, it has, it has, what it has said. Um, so uh, what we, we, we are trying to push is that we could look at Portuguese, so we don't need to look even at uh, other law, Portuguese securities law, where in the securities law, the, the, the court will indicate an entity responsible for managing the money. So what we don't know how to do is to manage the money, mm -hmm. that, which is ridiculous, isn't it? But this is what's going on. And um, we, we wondered, well, couldn't we look at securities law, where we know someone has to manage this, this amount of money. And um, because if you look at our constitution, if you have the right to apply for appropriate compensation, how, how can you void, through the doctrinal discussions, the right to obtain the compensation concretely? This is what we're trying to say. We need uh, a principle of effectiveness mm -hmm. in, the, in the protection. And so, um, the, the, the Supreme Court has given us uh, not a lot of comfort, but what we said is, imagine you take a five euro damage pro capita, okay? If you try to say you need the rules of civil liability again, well, then it's, 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 it's useless to use a popular action because the costs are just so high that it's going to be completely outweighed. So what we said, why don't we let the task remain with the court? I don't know how the judges would react, but our proposal would be, well, look at Holland. It, when they have a lump sum and they must have a simple way of distributing this money. And our idea is, okay, well then keep the task with the court if you're not comfortable historically of doing this. And we could find um, a simple way, for example, that the, uh, you have the, only a subjective requirement of having brought the product from the defendant during the relevant period. Um, we feel that if this is not done, then the law from 1995 um, is, is just not workable. And, um, and this has been the, the, the result of our, of our um, investigation. And so when uh, the, the, the doctrine, it was Leskin and Delatre, they had said that the Portuguese uh, law on class actions is the most extensive form of collective action based on the opt-out model available in the EU, or in theory is the most liberal regime in Europe. This might be true. In the, de in the design of part of it, we are missing the design on the part of m making things come true. Mm -hmm. And um, if uh, I, I, I think that from my experience speaking to the judiciary, sometimes I, I, I have a, an Italian piece inside me and I go up to the judges that I meet and sometimes I say, how does this work in practice? And sometimes, especially if you ask them about costs, um, and they look at you and they say, costs? What about costs? Oh, judges are occupied with more important issues, but I think we have to ask them and tell them, well, we need you to help us. And I think this is a case where we, we need guidance. Mm -hmm. And um, if declaratory actions serve to take clouds from legal relations, um, then we need the judges to take away the cloud of distribution. We, we need, otherwise, um, people but it has has one good effect so the telecom case had a lot of publicity and since citizens don't really know the difference between diffuse interests and individual fragmented ones they have been protected from all the pain and suffering jurists have gone through and they see they think the telecom was very heavily convicted by the judges because everybody got free phone calls for six weeks on sunday and um now there's a problem with the electrical company and the um, reputational enforcement of 2003 is functioning because now the same as Consumer Association DECU has gone to the electrical company and said, right, you have again 1,500,000 1, uh, clients. Now I'm going to negotiate with you under an auction form, better contracts. And if not, I'll um, lodge a civil popular action. So it has been working. Um, in reputational enforcement, but it would be, you know, desirable that we could go a little uh, further. And with this, um, I leave the floor to to Michele and to the to the other speakers.
Bravo. Grazie Eleonora, veramente anche impeccabile, abbiamo anche risparmiato due minuti, quindi veramente, tra l'altro ci lasci con questa idea del reputational enforcement, non oso immaginare cosa succederebbe in Italia, eh, soprattutto per rispondere alla tua domanda, how to manage money. Yeah. Bene, allora diamo la parola adesso a, a, al professor Francisco Marcos, che è in prima fila. Ah, scusami. Del, no, eh, sì. Oh. Professor Francisco Marcos dell'Istituto di Impresa di Madrid, devo dire che è un titolo abbastanza romantico. Sì, sì, romantico poetico direi, eh? io parlerò in italiano, sono così bravo, ma farò degli sbagli. Allora scusatemi prima di tutto, prima di tutto vorrei ringraziare a, al professor, eh, professore Carpagnano e al professore Venacchio per l'invito, è un piacere essere qua in questa città bella, pulita dell'Italia. Eh. Eh, il professore Carpagnano è un vero amico perché mi chiede a me di parlare di class action in Spagna e un, non so se farò una relazione che sicuramente sarà eh, la più breve e non così sofisticata come quella di, di Leonor si, si, si vede l'influenza del, del loan economics di, di, di Garupa eh, e io la avevo intitolato eh, una singola stella nell'universo del risarcimento dei danni per violazione delle norme antitrutte in Spagna perché c'è soltanto un'azione, allora è, questo è facilissimo, finisco subito. Va. Dopo io ehm, sono ehm, commercialista, ehm, faccio, eh, insegno diritto della concorrenza, non so niente di, diritto, di diritto della procedura civile, allora sarebbe eh, stupido che io parlassi di quello e, e poi non so se ha senso che nessuno dettagli qua all'olandese il sistema spagnolo no, non ha nessun senso perché chi se ne frega no? eh? <ride> eh, comunque qualcosa farò perché ho, ho fatto il viaggio a qua a Trento sarebbe un insulto non dire neanche qualcosa no? eh, prima di tutto l'inizio de, 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 de della de presentazione sono soltanto 11 slide soltanto 3 parlano di class action le altre sono un po' più eh, 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 al riguardo di quello che, che aveva detto prima Leonor, ehm, eh, Leonor, anche Muriel e Michele, abbiamo lavorato in un, in un progetto con Barry Roger che, che abbiamo fatto uno studio di eh, qual è lo stato del private enforcement in Europa, ne, negli stati membri, e io ho fatto Spagna, Leonor ha fatto Portogallo, Muriel eh, ha fatto Francia e, e Michele, bravo Michele, ha fatto Italia. No? Eh, io ho fatto la, il, il, il caso spagnolo e allora eh, questo è quello che mi permette di parlare di quante azioni sono. Eh, soltanto sono, eh, in Spagna abbiamo avuto negli ultimi 15 anni eh, 320 casi, quando parlo di casi va, parlo di procedure chiuse eh, a livello che sia, eh, nel quale il diritto antitrust si è stato eh, applicato dai giudici. Eh, e de, de questi casi eh, soltanto uno è un'azione una dai consumatori, un'azione class action che, che è la mia stella che parlerò dopo. Ehm, se vedete un po' i numeri, quello che accade è che eh, abbiamo, eh, adesso abbiamo eh, probabilmente eh, raggiunto la velocità di crociero, abbiamo 50 casi per anni, con bel numero. Eh, dopo parlerò un po' di questo, eh, se vediamo un po' i casi, quasi tutti sono stand alone, allora eh, soltanto eh, pochi eh, seguono le, le, le decisioni dell'autorità dell della concorrenza spagnola o della Commissione europea e, e anche questo è, è importante, quasi tutti, sono, sono, eh, quasi tutti perdono i demandanti. Eh, eh, come, come occorre anche come accade anche in Germania eh, non abbiamo molti casi di compensazioni monetarie invece quello che accade spesso è che i giudici eh, dichiarano la nullità de, dei rapporti contrattuali eh, ma non, non, non ci sono soldi involti allora è un po' povero questo no? eh, well, ci sono altri dati rilevanti come vedete non parlo ancora di class, act, class action, eh, ma dopo farò il mio compito, eh, soprattutto si utilizza come, 
con mi ataco, eh, 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 ben que ci siano delle volte che si utilizza come difesa e eh, altri eh, casi nel quale si, si impiega come eh, sistema di tutela eh, cautelare e soprattutto si parla sempre del 101 o la, la stessa eh, regola domestica. Dopo, eh, se parliamo dei settori che, che, che ne abbiamo, quello più eh, impattante, sì, questo può essere impattante, è che abbiamo eh, più della metà dei, case, dei casi che abbiamo in Spagna eh, sono al riguardo delle eh, distribuzioni della benzina, eh, benché eh, le stazioni, gli impianti di servizio eh, domandano alle, alle, ai eh, fabbricanti di benzina eh, perdono quasi sempre, ma comunque <ride> continuano a demandare, allora è, è, è troppo triste. E, e, forse anche è un caso di avvocati che sono di cattiva qualità. No? Ma... E, arrivo alla mia, alla mia stella, e, se, se vediamo eh, eh, soltanto c'è un caso, di, 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 come dicevo, di class action, Grazie Michele per questo, eh. Eh, devo, fare, devo corrisponderti in qualsiasi momento nel futuro. E c'è un caso, è una follow on action, ma dopo, dopo eh, grazie, ma dopo devo parlare perché non ci sono, allora quello è lo, lo più difficile, eh, allora non è così amico. Eh, questo caso è, è ancora è in corso, è stata una domanda iniziata da una associazione de, dei consumatori di Ausbank eh, che non ha una buona reputazione come associazione di, di eh, consumatori, qualcuno parla di loro come se fossero pirati, ma eh, comunque sono lì e, e teoricamente sono riconosciuti legalmente per agire, benché questo sia messo in dubbio ogni tanto. Infatti eh, eh, dico che il caso è in corso perché eh, la domanda è cominciata nel 2008 e a fine di oggi ancora non hanno fatto niente. Eh, 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 secondo me eh, bueno, ci sono stati eh, 4 o 5 eh, decisioni da, da giudici, del giudice di prima, di prima istanza e anche della, della Corte Provinciale di Madrid. E, e quello che accade in questo caso, secondo me, è che Telefonica ha eh, ottimi avvocati che ha, fino adesso sono riusciti a frenare ogni eh, intento di eh, Ausbank per fare niente. E, eh, probabilmente questo ha eh, qualche eh, rapporto con il sistema legale che noi abbiamo di class action, eh, del quale dopo parlerò, ma... Fino adesso quello che è accaduto è che prima Telefonica ha legato la pregiudizialità amministrativa, come sapete la decisione amministrativa che qua si segue è quella della decisione della, la decisione, la decisione della Commissione di punire a, a Telefonica per il squeeze out eh, nel ADS, ADSL eh, nel 2007, soltanto nel 2012 è stata eh, la confermazione di questa Um, decisione dalla Corte di, di Generale e dopo eh, al margine della pregiudizialità amministrativa c'è stato il problema delle eh, formalità delle azioni collettive o azioni di classe in Spagna che eh, chiedono eh, al demandante di fare eh, comunicazione a tutti gli altri potenziali eh, interessati allora noi abbiamo un sistema opt-in e quello ha ritardato molto l'inizio, come dicevo eh, ancora niente. E quell'ultimo che è accaduto non eh, molto tempo fa, mi sembra che fa un mese, benché io non sia riuscito a, a leggere ancora la decisione, è che la, la, il Tribunale ha, a, le ha eh, privato all'Associazione dei Consumatori Ausbank della abilitazione legale per agire in questo caso, eh, allora non so cosa, cosa accadrà. No? Eh, la unica eh, slide che io ce ne ho, eh, non c'è nessun numero, nessun articolo della legge spagnola di procedura civile, benché se volete eh, io vi li posso eh, fornire, 
Aparentemente sono nella legge spagnola eh, provisioni varie eh, che permettono di eh, agire in difesa degli interessi collettivi diffusi. È vero, eh, come diceva prima eh, Leonor, la professora Rossi, che in Spagna anche se uno si mette a leggere eh, i libri di procedura civile c'è questa discussione densa, profonda, se l'interesse collettivo è lo stesso che il diffuso, non si capisce niente. Comunque al margine di cui sicuramente qua in Italia è lo stesso, vero? Eh, ma dai. Eh, no, qualcuno ci capisce. Eh, 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 ma comunque al margine di che ancora non sappiamo cosa è, se ci sono dottrine di un altro o dell'altro, eh, c'è possibilità di azioni, eh, ben che siano delle associazioni di consumatori legalmente abilitate, e eh, eh, dopo anche eh, azioni di eh, gruppo, eh, di classe, di eh, individui, che, eh, agenti che siano stati danneggiati di una, di una mh, pratica anticocorrenziale. Secondo me quello che accade è che se uno legge le, le regole, sono nelle regole eh, pretesti, eh, troppi pretesti che permettono ai giudici di eh, usare il formalismo giuridico per eh, frenare e non permettere le azioni di eh, cominciare o neanche con, continuare. No? Come dicevo prima, eh, ad esempio la legge eh, di procedura civile spagnola eh, considera nel caso, nel caso di, di azione di, di gruppo che il demandante de, è in carico di eh, comunicare l'inizio della demanda agli altri potenzialmente interessati e deve, fare lui, deve caricare lui con i costi, allora eh, questo non è un incentivo precisamente per eh, agire, altrimenti deve farsi, nel caso di che l'azione la eh, cominci da un'associazione di consumatori, una valutazione se l'associazione la, ha eh, abilitazione legale per agire, eh, e neanche questo apparentemente è facile, e, eh, e dopo ci sono i costi eh, di organizzare o comunicare l'azione collettiva. No? Eh, comunque, come diceva prima, soltanto abbiamo una, ne abbiamo una. E dopo, se uno si mette a guardare mh, le azioni di classe, le class action che noi abbiamo eh, in Spagna in altre materie diverse, in altre materie diverse di antitrust, Ce ne sono eh, alcune, eh, secondo quello che ho visto nelle statistiche, statistiche eh, ci sono normalmente 10 all'anno, eh, benché eh, riguardano soprattutto contratti e, e, e condizioni generali della contrattazione, c'è alcuna anche di, di, di danni eh, stracontrattuali, eh, eh, anche, ci sono almeno una o due su eh, concorrenza sleale, riguardano come dico la slide di eh, contratti finanziari, soprattutto contratti di servizi di telecomunicazioni, anche contratti di educazione o finanziamento. C'è stato il fallimento di una grossa ditta di educazione eh, che anche forniva il finanziamento per i corsi e questo ha eh, dato luogo a... a di decine di, 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 di azioni collettive e, e anche in, nel caso di, di turismo, dei contratti di trasporto. Eh, ma se vediamo un po' i numeri, e se qualcuno vuole io, io, io vi li posso fornire, eh, normalmente non coinvolgono collettivi grossi, eh, solo delle... adesso eh, dal, abbiamo quasi dal 2000 a oggi, eh, come dicevo prima, 10 all'anno, abbiamo 120-130 e soltanto tre di questi casi hanno coinvolto a più di 500 eh, consumatori, quasi tutti sono eh, decinaia di consumatori e le quantità eh, o le compensazioni che si hanno eh, richiamato non sono, eh, sono come media di 2000 eh, per i eh, consumatori eh, che, che era rappresentato la, la domanda. Allora, eh, questo è un po' il panorama che abbiamo. Ci sono class action, eh, come ci sono anche, eh, eh, come c'è anche applicazione privata, ma è vero che non 
ci troviamo in, un, in una situazione di sviluppo eh, del sistema eh, probabilmente ottimo. E con questo eh, torno all'ultima eh, slide, eh, ho visto che, che Michele ha maturato da due anni, a, a, adesso non ha la sveglia, eh, questo <ride> significa che è, più, è meno aggressivo con noi, eh, comunque non devi usarla con me. Eh, che cosa accade secondo me, eh, o quali sono, io non ho le risposte, soltanto ho dubbi qua, no? eh, non so, sicuramente il, ci sono anche questi dubbi quando uno parla della, della, delle class action a, a qua in Italia, no? perché secondo quello che ho visto non ci sono tante. No? Eh, quando parliamo di class action o di azioni collettive in antitrust, quello che forse accade è che ci, si si mescolano due problemi. Prima, non, come diceva eh, Leonor prima, non, non ci sono tante azioni di applicazione privata antitrust, non, non, non c'è un sviluppo eh, brutale dell'applicazione privata e poi eh, neanche ci sono eh, azioni collettive in genere. Eh, allora abbiamo due problemi che si mescolano qua e che forse non hanno una facile soluzione. Si, eh, ripara questo con una riforma legale o dei dubbi uh, io eh, chiuderei con 4 o 5 eh, domande eh, non so se questi applicano in Italia, secondo quello che ho chiesto almeno le due prime cose che, che, che devo dire non sono uguali qua in Spagna secondo me manca eh, benché la crisi ha cambiato un po' questo eh una coscienza dei diritti dei consumatori eh, e soprattutto nel, nell'area antitrust questo veramente accade, benché adesso con la crisi, soprattutto le ipoteche, i contratti di condizioni generali, c'è abbastanza azione nei tribunali, eh, questo non accade in antitrust. Sicuramente in Spagna è molto importante che il, il sistema de, eh, o il movimento associativo dei consumatori è completamente sottosviluppato, abbiamo tre associazioni e una eh, la gente la considera dei pirati, allora questo non va bene, ho sentito che qua in Italia è diverso e che sono eh, più forti, eh, forse qua in Italia c'è più società civile, avete il movimento delle 5 stelle. Eh? E dopo, eh, eh, come dicevo, eh, altre due cose, la ignoranza dei effetti negativi delle pratiche anticoncorrenziali, eh, questo eh, eh, ancora non c'è, almeno nella Spagna, stesso il senso dei consumatori eh, che, che sia il diritto della concorrenza e quali siano i danni del diritto della concorrenza. Eh, e, e finalmente eh, il tema de, degli in, in, incentivi per le azioni, no? Eh, io veramente eh, non, non capisco mai come sono questi dubbi, ah, il, qua tornerà il sistema una class action americana, ma come? Non abbiamo qua avvocati come gli, gli americani, quanti eh, avvocati italiani hanno dei jet? Frignani? Lui viaggia in treno. Allora, eh, secondo me l'atteggiamento del sistema di avvocatura in Stati Uniti è completamente diverso, non, è di, non dico che sia meglio o peggio, ma qua è impossibile implantare quello qua, no? eh, ma non so come si possono cambiare gli incentivi degli avvocati e dei consumatori per eh, fargli de, iniziare più eh, casi, no? e con questo chiudo, grazie. Grazie, Mi ringrazio davvero il professor Marcos per questa eccellente presentazione volevo fare due precisazioni però alla sua presentazione la prima che quando si riferiva al fatto di essere un commercialista non si riferiva all'accezione italiana del termine essere un professore di diritto commerciale in Spagna la seconda quando faceva riferimento alla sveglia è perché nella precedente edizione nel 2011 avevo usato un escamotage per tenere i nostri relatori strettamente il professore lo ricorda aderenti al tempo che avevamo dato quindi appena scadevano i 20 minuti scattava una sveglia Quest'anno abbiamo deciso di essere un po' più clementi, anche perché avevamo un po' più di tempo libero. Decisione.
Quindi, eh, fatte queste dovute precisazioni, eh, passo subito la parola alla professoressa Chagny dell'Università di Versailles, che ci parlerà di una nuova prospettiva di Jure Convento, no? perché in Francia eh, è tutto ancora in evoluzione, c'è un draft molto interessante, quindi do subito la parola alla professoressa. Grazie. Grazie. Alea jacta est. Il dado è tratto. Come Cesare, il presidente francese, François Hollande, ha attraversato il Rubicon in azione collettiva. Um, well, I'm sorry, but I will have to switch to English despite my grand grand, my, uh, my Italian grand grand mother. <laughs> so I will switch to English. The introduction of an effective class action finally appears to be on the agenda in France. It's even the key measure of a bill to be submitted to the French Parliament in June, which even dedicates the iconic Article 1 to it. Consequently, the title chosen for this speech, Much Ado About Nothing, with a cautious caution mark, would seem to belong to a bygone era. For the last 40 years, despite very, very numerous drafts and announcements, nothing concrete has developed in France. One can refer, to be exact, to an exception, that is, a joint representative action. But this action has neither flourished nor been successful. In short, much ado about nothing or practically nothing, and contrary to other countries, to some other countries, to this stage, I must say that our cruising speed in collective antitrust redress is zero, clearly zero. Currently, we have a draft bill. Mm -hmm. Even if the draft bill could still be changed as Maybe uh, when, uh, when uh, the parliament will examine it, as Mr. Lasser told yesterday, that he was more confident in parliament. What is about this current draft bill? Well, it appears, it clearly appears, that the Rubicon has been crossed for the French government, as there is the introduction of the class action and it constitutes a real change. But the Rubicon is being crossed gradually and with a very, very, very courteous approach. Caution can be seen first in the general idea of the class action which is going to be introduced in the consumer code and design for consumers. That's we will see to begin. Caution is even more evident, second, regarding antitrust enforcement. Oh, what's happened? Did I do this? No, I don't Shall I continue so. or? Yeah, uh, let's check if it's a very easy thing to, to resolve. Like our class action, <laughs> until now, <Yeah>. nothing. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's maybe, maybe it's an opponent to the class action <laughs> in France. Uh, we have to wait three minutes because they shut down the ah, class, and we have to wait that the class finish to shut down, and then. <laughs> well. Do you, want, so, three minutes. do you want that I continue, continue. for a few continue. minutes? Continue. Yeah. Continue, so, um, caution, as I, as I said, is very evident, second, when we regard antitrust enforcement. Because contrary to other countries, like UK, for example, the French government hasn't incorporated class action in an overall antitrust approach, but in a consumer law approach. One can wonder, in this case, whether this action is appropriate, is really appropriate to competition law. So, we will 
began with the cautious class action intended for our consumers. <laughs> One step in, at a time. Uh, maybe I could say baby step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those who drafted the current bill appear to have made this, this maxim. The draft bill certainly promotes a real class action in favor of consumers. However, this class action is accompanied by Uh, well, okay. without micro. No, no, no. Let's... This one? Yeah. This one, okay. okay. <laughs> well, no, I'm very sorry. I will try to continue. Why... <laughs> this... <laughs> Never mind. In France, we've got a, a very strong uh, trade association, which is called the MEDEF. Uh -huh. And yeah, a very strong opponent to class action. I think. Maybe you've got uh, someone from the MEDEF in the, in the, in the room <laughs> who cut the micro, <laughs> etc., etc. So, <laughs> however, as I, as I told you, <laughs> after the micro, before the micro, etc., etc., this class action is accompanied by several precautions and safeguards. Oh, anyway, let's not keep quiet. How oh, happy we are, how oh, happy am I that there is a real class action that is about to be recognized under French law. As you can see, um, <laughs> as you can't see, <laughs> as you will see, <laughs> there is an article which would enable <laughs> an action in compensation for the individual damage suffered by a group of consumers in an identical or similar situation and caused by the same business due to breach of its legal or contractual duties. The idea is clearly to bundle their claims in a single collective redress procedure. I must add that there is a plus in the mechanism for mediation but as an option offered and not as a mandatory preliminary stage. Mm -hmm. It's logically stated <clears throat> that the decision, the collective advice decision as, oh, well, uh, yeah, I think Step by step. Okay, <laughs> step by step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> okay. uh, I'm not sure, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, it's I logically. Need to stop here. It's not yeah, down, I'm no. a lucky girl. <laughs> it's my day. So it's logically stated that the decision, the collective redress decision, has the authority of res judicata with respect to each member of the group. In addition, the draft contains some provisions relating to relationship between individual and collective actions. For instance, it provides suspension of the limitations of individual action. It also indicates that belonging to a group doesn't prevent from bringing an individual action for damage that is out of the field of the class action, for instance, pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. More eye-catching, if you can see, yeah, you can <laughs> see. More eye-catching is the provision that states any clause aimed at prohibiting a person in advance from taking part in a class action should be deemed invalid. However, the cautious approach is obvious in various aspects, as we will see now. Caution can clearly be seen first in terms of the field covered by the class action. The main choice has been made to place consumers at the heart of the mechanism by making them the sole beneficiaries of class action. And this choice is logically reflected in the inclusion of rules in the consumer code. Consequently, there are strong limitations as regards standing. The right to bring a class action is reserved for consumer association, representative at national level. In other words, the initiative is narrowly restricted to a limited number of bodies. 
Secondly, secondly, the process for bringing the action is also a very cautious one. The draft favors an opt-in model of collective redress, that is to say, undoubtedly, the most cautious option. Without going into details, for reasons of time, we can observe that the bill has adopted a system in two sequences with many, many safeguards to protect against American <laughs> frivolous or unmeritorious cases, and in which the judge has an essential role. As a first step relating to the liability, there is a strong process of judicial certification, including a preliminary merits test. After checking the prerequisites, ruling on the liability, setting criteria for belonging to the group, and determining the elements to assess the damage, the judge must order at the business expenses all measures necessary to inform by any appropriate means, so it is wide, consumer likely to belong to the group. But it is important to notice that the measures may not be implemented until the time limits given for appeals, for all appeals and court cassation to have expired. This could easily last for several years. Maybe it risks to be too late. I don't know. At the final stage, the time for settlements of the damages arrives and the end of the proceedings. As the judge is the key man, and it's necessary that courts have the resources for handling mass litigation, if there are, if there are some, if there are some, <laughs> I don't know. The draft intends to centralize referrals in favor of, of especially designated courts of first instance, likely for the sake of efficiency. It now remains to be seen whether this class action designed for consumer law is really appropriate for competition law. We should certainly be celebrating that antitrust hasn't been set aside by the draft as it wasn't so obvious at the beginning. It was very debated, I think. However, this extension once again due to caution, is of a limited scope, as we will see first. Furthermore, the adaptation to competition law calls for, calls for certain reservation and is subject to criticism. As you know, French people are very keen on criticism. And I'm a real French girl. Mm -hmm. The draft contains a section five that is special, specially dedicated to the class action taking place within the area of competition. More specifically stated is the damage caused, caused due to anti-competitive practices. Unfair competition and or French restrictive practices don't fall within the field of collective redress mechanism. They are outside. Second, the bill includes a time restriction by providing that the action may not be made to compensate for the damage caused by anti-competitive practices that have been the subject of an infringement decision that became final before the entry into force of the law. For instance, it won't be possible to bring a class action as far as the very, very famous mobile cartel is concerned. The case is handed, so no class action. Third, and more significantly, a provision provides limitation on the right to bring a class action. It states that the action can only be brought before the judge on the basis of a previous final infringement decision. I was sorry, there is a mistake on my paper. The choice has been made to limit class action to follow-on action. 
It is true that, in this case, and as it is stated in the draft, the bridge shall be considered as established. But, in my view, it is not sufficient to prohibit standalone action, standalone class actions. Why? It would be better to allow them, whether they are brought on reliance, in reliance of, on a prior infringement decision or not. Why do we distinguish? I don't, I can't understand that. As it is referred to an infringement decision, it closes the door on any class action in the case of a commitment procedure. As you know, in this kind of procedure, you avoid a finding of guilt. So, no class action anymore. As the draft refers to a national, national authority or court, it seems, but I'm not sure, and I think that it is not the willingness of the authors, but maybe it is possible to bring a class action not only on the basis <coughs> of a French or European decision, but also on the basis of another member state decision, such like in Germany. Mm -hmm. It would be a discreet and involuntary <laughs> rallying to the German solution. A second question is related to the reference made by the draft to the authorities or courts. Does it mean that a class action can only be drafted after public enforcement? Or, more broadly, does it mean that a class action may also be brought after a private individual action before a court. It's not clear in the draft. It's not clear. A doubt exists and should be removed in my point of view. Well, <clears throat> if it is possible, I don't know, but if it is possible to act after an individual private action, it's worth shortening the time limits in a run to the overlapping of two sets of proceedings, an individual one and after that a collective one. It's too long. And that's just time now to have a quick look to the adaptation of the class action to competition law. The, limited, the, choice, the legitimate choice of reserving the class action for a limited number of courts begs the question. Will the list of the happy chosen ones be the same that the one which already exists in France for the implementation of antitrust law? This would be undoubtedly desirable, but I don't know. However, the adaptation to competition law is insufficient in my view. SMEs are excluded from the benefit of the class action. I don't see why, I don't understand why, because SMEs are on an equal footing with consumers regarding their ability to seek redress for infringement decision. Consequently, and as far as entitled entities are concerned, it would be better, in my view, to allow trade association, maybe not the MEDEF, I don't think it would be useful, but it would be better to allow trade association to act on, be on behalf of businesses. Furthermore, some difficulties specific to competition law have been concealed or omitted because it's a consumer law approach. So these specific difficulties have been omitted. You won't be surprised that this concern especially is the difficulty of establishing both causal link and the, the amount of damage. What about the difficult burden of proof in the event of passing on? Nothing is said in the draft, nothing at all. Generally speaking, the main issue, as Roberto Schiepa told us this morning, is the extent to which claimants should have access to documents mm -hmm. in the NCA files to substantiate their claims, 
the proof risk being made more difficult in so far as the recent French legislation fully exempts, fully exempts leniency files from any disclosure. And more broadly, this legislation greatly reduces the possibility for a plaintiff, for a plaintiff, a complainant to obtain elements from the competition authority files in any case, in any case. It's a full protection which is loaded and according to, my, to me, it's too much. I think we need to find the right, the right balance between public and private interests. Uh, as you can see, as you can understand, I would have clearly preferred a class action designed in an overall approach on private enforcement. However, and to be honest, mm -hmm. I must recognize that it's very easy to criticize, mm -hmm. but it's more difficult yeah, to, to get the art of legislating right. Nonetheless, I have a dream, mm -hmm. a dream that competition law will be taken more into account in the bill that is to be adopted in September. Okay. In that case, it will be my very great pleasure to talk to you again <laughs> um, and to come back to Italian. <laughs> Sono venuto, <laughs> ho visto e lo farò. Mm -hmm. Grazie mille per la vostra attenzione e per l'invito a Michele e Gian Antonio. Grazie. Thank you very much, Muriel, for this very interesting uh, presentation, for sharing with us your uh, views, your uh, criticism, and also your dreams. So thank you very much. I, I have a question. Do you think really that there is some chan chance to change this text before September or not? Because, uh, yes? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I, I know that uh, it's possible that the parliament could change something, but I don't know what. Uh, I'm sure that, for, it depends. I'm sure that SMS won't be taken into account as it is a consumer law. So I'm afraid that it's, it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could have some changes um, in some points, but I, I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm not, as you understood, the author of the draft. <laughs> Ok, grazie, grazie ancora per questa precisazione. Ora non ci resta che dare la parola all'avvocato Michael Lassen, eh, che insomma ci parlerà di questi abusi della class action, tanto evocati negli Stati Uniti d'America, di queste paure, insomma finalmente potremo capire quali sono le paure delle, delle istituzioni comunitarie, ma come ti dicevo in apertura spero che potrai sottolineare anche gli aspetti positivi di questo strumento negli Stati Uniti d'America. A te la parola, grazie. Grazie. Uh, now that I... Now that I have to open my mouth, I'll be found out that I'm not Italian. I, I dressed in Armani from head to foot, hoping to fool all of you, because nothing would be a greater compliment than to be thought of as Italian. And, uh, but now that I have to speak, you know, it's not true. I do want to thank the university for giving me an excuse to return to this country that I love so much and to address all of you on a topic that were this uh, a, a seminar I would be giving in the United States would cover at least a day. So I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version, 20 minutes of the American class action system, its abuse and possible safeguards for European countries. A small topic for 20 minutes, but we'll do our best. Um, Leonor mentioned that the Spanish system of class action is very old, 1995. The United States federal version goes back to 1966. Uh, she mentioned 37 class actions in 20 years. Uh, Francesco mentioned 319 in 14 years. In California alone, the, the state in which my law office is based, we can have upwards of 100 class actions in a week. <laughs> Every week. One state out of the 50, and that doesn't include 
So anyway, so when, uh, while I I'm, I'm love Muriel dearly, the cautious approach may not be a bad thing if you don't want to have thousands of class actions filed every year, which is what we have in the United States. Um, there is no limit on them. That's why I won't be addressing uh, whether it's anti-competition, antitrust, or, or uh, a competition laws, because it doesn't matter. In the United States, if you fit the rules, you can bring it as a class action. So anything goes. Um, uh, Senor Alfaro mentioned the, uh, the antitrust issues and the difficulty in, in some of the decisions that have been made in Europe, the United States Supreme Court on its antitrust cases has actually said, we realize we have said that this conduct is an antitrust violation and that the identical conduct in a different case was not. They don't explain how they reach different decisions. We really don't understand our own antitrust system. It's, it's almost a determination of what we think is going on in the mind of the company as to what it's doing. Doesn't work too well since most of our judges are not proficient in being psychic, but it's our system. Uh, I do men agree with uh, Senor Alfro, though, that the issue over one of the cases he gave an example on is one I actually have now. I have a, cos a cosmetic company in Texas that believes if it allows its product to be sold on the internet, that it will diminish the brand. It will be seen that there will be cost cutting and it will be seen as a lesser brand. So it doesn't want to be sold on the internet. I don't agree with them. It's not my call. It's their business. They think that's how they will grow bigger is through individual doctors selling these. They may be wrong, but they should have the right to be wrong without being accused of violating antitrust laws. In any event, uh, having, having gone through some general issues, let me cover the American federal system, not the individual states. We have 50 states, each with their own system for class actions, and I will just cover the, the federal system. Uh, the first group of tests that must be met for any class action for, hits four topics, numerosity, commonality, typicality, and adequacy of the representative. So numerosity, generally, I'll be very quick on it, if it's under 30, it's not enough. Over 50, it'll usually be enough. The question is, does the judge think it's impractical, impracticable, unworkable to bring everybody into court? And you balance that against the fact that the defendant has a due process right to <coughs> individually defend against each claim, each class member's claims. So the question becomes one of what is unworkable. Uh, commonality. So now, are there common questions of law or fact? This is not for the individual. This is for who we consider to be in the class. So like numerosity, what we're looking at is what is the class like? Is it homogeneous? Do the people that, that we're trying to bring into court have similar interests? Are they aligned? And if that's the case, then, uh, then we meet that test. Damages are not part of that. Everyone's damage can be different. But in, as an example, I'm sure you all remember a few years ago, the levees in New Orleans broke and the city was flooded and the homeowners brought a class action. And some of them lost their homes entirely. Others just had water damage. But they were all affected by the same event. So they, there is commonality, even though the damages may be measured differently. Um, typicality. Now we're looking at the named plaintiff, the representative, the person who filed the lawsuit. 
is that person's claim typical of the class claims? Because the claims of the class will be limited to what the individual is allowed to bring. What are they, how were they injured? If they would not have standing to bring those claims, they can't bring them on behalf of the class. The individual plaintiff has to have standing. So they had to have been injured, they had to have suffered the claim, the, the damage they're claiming on behalf of the class. Adequacy of the representation. This is really a test more of the lawyer than of the plaintiff. The, if approved, this lawyer will be representing the dozens, perhaps hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people, or in the case of a telephone company, millions of people that are not in court. So the judge wants to make sure, the system wants to make sure, will they be adequately represented? Does this person know what they're doing? Uh, theoretically, that should cut down on abuse. Unfortunately, that test is, um, I've not, it is extremely rare that any class action will be defeated on the grounds of inadequate representation, even when they should be. So it's, uh, it's more lip service than anything else. You do need to look at the adequacy of the representative to some extent. They, they at least should be interested in the lawsuit. They should not have interests antagonistic to the, claim, to the claims of the class. Some people are only in it, uh, they bring it as a class action because they want to maximize the chance that they get an individual settlement. Well, they're not looking after the interests of the class, so that would be an, inag an inadequate representative. But um, it's a very difficult thing to defeat class certification on the grounds of adequate representation. So those four requirements are the first step, and then you need to meet one other, and it's one of three other requirements. The first is whether these claims, if they were brought as separate actions, would create a risk of inconsistent rulings, um, or, or a ruling that m for one individual that may be dispositive of the others. Uh, if, for example, I were to bring a lawsuit against an insurance company and say you must offer this to your uh, policyholders and I win, and uh, Francesco brings a claim against the exact same insurance company and says you must not offer this, and he wins, the insurance company has two court orders that are diametrically opposed. It can't do both. If there's a, that's a possibility then uh, that would fall within that category. It's almost never used in the United States. It exists on paper, but it's a very difficult test to meet. It generally will fall under one of the other two that I'll cover. Uh, the second one is that the defendant has acted or refused to act on grounds generally applicable to the entire class. Much easier. So. Generally, the person will say, you must offer earthquake insurance to us. It's generally to everybody. You don't usually have someone saying, you must not offer me earthquake insurance. <laughs> so the, those are uh, declarations or injunctions, declaratory judgments or injunctive relief. And that's the predominant relief sought. And if that's the case, then you can get it certified under that test. It is a very important question because if it is under this standard, there is no opt-out right. There is no right to notice. Discrimination claims often fall under this. If you tell a uh, company, uh, you must not discriminate in hiring women, it doesn't matter that we don't give notice to women. It doesn't matter whether they would ever apply to this company or not. If the court agrees, that company must stop discriminating against women, period. And it can't say, well, it's okay for me to discriminate against Leonor because she opted out of the class. <laughs> doesn't work that way. <laughs> there is no opt out. <laughs> you just stop what you're doing. So those very commonly discrimination claims are brought under this standard. The last test is for money. 
And now you have a right to opt out. Now you must have a right to notice. And that notice is not optional, it's mandatory. It it's, uh, finds its roots in the United States Constitution's right to due process. So it must be the best notice practicable. How do we make sure we reach the people that were affected? That means if it's a bank, with a claim that we are, you may have read one of the big claims now is that banks have timed deposits and withdrawals on ATMs to create shortfalls so they can charge fees to cover them. Well, if you're going to do that kind of thing where there's money involved and you know the, the names, of course, of your customers, you must give them personal notice. You have to mail personal notice to them. If you don't know who they are, what's the next best thing? It really, you, you have to think about what is the question. We had a case for a company that developed a muscle building supplement. And it happened to be that we learned through a study that almost all of the people who bought this supplement also bought a certain fitness magazine. Well, rather than a newspaper, the court said, put the notice in that magazine. That's much more likely to get the people who bought the supplement than the New York Times. <laughs> so put it in the magazine. If you, you really think about it, it's common sense. We want to give notice. We want people to know their rights are being affected, especially so they can opt out if they don't want to have that lawyer represent them, they realize, gee, now that I'm reading this, maybe I'll hire my own lawyer because I wondered why I was suffering medical problems from this. My damages are big enough, I'll just get my own lawyer and bring it myself. Uh, you have the right to opt out. You, you will not then be bound by the judgment, and all of this is done preliminarily. Um, so that test is, is the, uh, for money is, again, commonality. Are there, do common questions of law and fact predominate? And is the class action the superior way of resolving this dispute? That means the court also looks at whether it's manageable. What will this trial look like? And it's a much tougher standard than the commonality I mentioned earlier. I apologize that in our American system we have two tests that both have commonality in them. But in the B3 text context, it's a much more rigorous analysis. And the court is looking at what will this trial look like if I have to, uh, to resolve this. Is it going to be workable? Um, so those general outlines govern um, that the, the rules for bringing a class action. Um, now, what are some of the recent trends? Because class actions can destroy a company, and I mean literally, not because they lose it, but because they cannot even afford to defend it. Um, the, there is a big push right now for arbitration clauses and trying to have consumers and everybody else imaginable waive their right to participate in a class action as part of the service provided by the company, whether it's a cell phone service, which is the lead case that came out in the United States. It involved AT&T, whether it's purchasing vehicles, whatever the contract may be, but it's only federal. It's the Federal Arbitration Act, and it is um, resisted mightily by many states, including California, that does everything possible to get around the federal law and, and uh, strike down arbitration clauses. So it's, um, it's subject to abuse on both sides. I think that Arbitration certainly makes sense in a lot of situations. On the other hand, if you do have a telephone company that has so many millions of people and has an incentive to do just a small thing, then it adds up over time. 
I can't believe we've already gone through 20 minutes. <laughs> you have I have a few a, more minutes. Do I have a few more minutes? I'm going, to, go I'm going to jump to safeguards for European communities. <laughs> uh, because when I spoke in Brussels, a lot of countries came up to me asking about whether I'd be willing to go and speak to the governments about ways of implementing a class action system. I do support it. I just think it has to be done properly. And I think our system in America is broken. And I've told them any time, any place, I'll pay my own way. I'd rather see a country do it right than get through what we're doing. Um, the cost has to be considered. The US Supreme Court has warned people that class actions can be used as a sword because it's just too expensive to defend yourself against them, especially now with electronic discovery that is just flourishing in the United States. It can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for a company merely to produce all of the emails and all of the electronic data that is now kept in the normal course of business just to move a case forward. Um, so what other things can be learned from our system? And I can't address all of them, but just generally. What is the purpose of the law? What are you trying to accomplish as a country, France, looking at this? What is it trying to accomplish? If the, there are attorneys in America who have told judges, this law was enacted for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not why we passed the laws. <laughs> we did not pass laws to be full employment acts for lawyers. Um, there are lawyers who hire plaintiffs to rep so they can represent them in class actions. That's an abuse. There are lawyers who have an infrastructure that just go around looking for reasons to sue companies. If the purpose is to create litigation, follow our model. <laughs> but I don't think most countries have that in mind when they're considering class actions. So what are you trying to accomplish? And if you're trying to resolve consumer issues, how is the best way to do that without uh, creating the risk that what you're really doing is creating an attorney fee motion for people? So um, I do know, I, if there's one thing I know, Italian coffee is the best in the world. So I don't want to intrude on the coffee break more than I have to. But I'm happy to answer questions during the break. And, uh, and I'm happy to give any of you who wish it a, a card. And you're welcome to contact me with any other questions that we haven't had time for. Grazie. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this very, very useful presentation. Um, Continuo a parlare in italiano perché insomma l'accordo era quello, il panel sarebbe stato ufficialmente in italiano. E, beh, direi che siamo perfettamente in tempo, abbiamo iniziato dalle 3.01, sono le 17.04 del tempo in effetti del caffè, eh, però non volevo disperdere questo buon feeling che si era creato per magari o approfittare per o qualche domanda al volo o magari se avete la, la pazienza di scrivere, neanche, o anche nel frattempo pensare durante il caffè a qualche domanda, scrivere su un foglietto, farcela avere e alla fine della prossima sessione facciamo una risposta generale a delle domande che immagino e spero insomma, che ci siano da parte del pubblico. Flash. Can you explain a little bit on the certification? One minute. One minute, minute on the certification. <laughs> <No. laughs> uh, so the plaintiff will bring a motion. I know for two minutes. <laughs> A plaintiff will bring a motion and he will need to set out his evidence and his argument for each of the, uh, for each of the elements that he's trying to fit under. And a defendant will then argue against them. That motion to a class action defense lawyer like me, that is the trial. If you lose that, you've lost the case. That is my trial. Winning that motion is more important than winning the trial. So if I win that motion and then I go to trial on an individual labor law claim, what do I care? The damages are nothing compared to on a class-wide basis. So each element must, now it, it used to be 
in the federal system that all you did was just look at the rules and not at the merits. You don't look at the merits. That has changed significantly over the past 10 years, including the most recent United States Supreme Court decisions. The court has said it's unworkable. The merits are interwoven, intertwined with the class certification issues. The judge must, in the appropriate circumstance, look at both, consider both, understand the case as a whole, and then rule on the motion. So the, the judge can later, you can then bring a motion later to decertify the class if the defense gets new evidence, or if it's denied, you can bring a new motion later to try and have it certified, but that's the general process. It's done through a lawn motion, and the judge can take evidence. He can have expert witnesses in the right case. It, it can be a mini trial in its own. You concentrated on the federal level. Could you, of course, I'm not asking you to enter into all the 50 systems, but uh, could you indicate to us, is there any meaningful thing to be said on a radically different approach in one or more states as compared to the federal system? Uh, sure. The, the, there are, the reason that the Class Action Fairness Act was enacted was because lawyers would forum shop, bringing up our earlier case a discussion, on which state to bring an action in because of the difference in the rules. In California, the state law is written so a judge can basically say, I just think it's a good idea. Let's do this as a class action. Other judges say, we're going to follow the federal rule, and that's how we're going to decide it. But it's a free-for-all. In Madison County, Illinois, in outside Chicago, there, is an air, uh, uh, there were judges that were certifying class actions because they would get money for it. They would get the court system benefits if people file lawsuits in their jurisdictions. In San Francisco, almost every asbestos case is filed in San Francisco. Tens of thousands of dollars in fees come into San Francisco's court system because of that. So you, you create... Uh, you create a, a court system that wants to invite certain lawsuits and gets a bit too chummy with the plaintiffs to have them bring them there because of the fees that get generated from it. So the reason the federal system is, is one I prefer to practice in is that's not an issue. The judges aren't interested in that. But certain states, uh, I heard a justice from West Virginia's uh, Supreme Court tell people we settle, we approve settlements that judges reject because the court system gets some of the money from the settlement. <laughs> Grazie. Bene, allora adesso è il tempo del caffè. Dopo la pausa riprenderemo, a, cercheremo di capire come sono invitanti le azioni di classe in Italia. Ringrazio tutti per l'attenzione e la pazienza e a tra poco.